Mark. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Ryan. I work for Intel's Open Source Technology Center here in London. Uh, my talk is about command line scripting with templates. And when I talk about templates, what I'm talking about is little scripts that you can write using the templating engine that is supplied with Go standard library. So I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there is actually a programming language built into the standard library. Um, and it's a template-based programming language, and it is usually used to create documents. So what you can do is you can take a document that's annotated with some template directives, and you can combine this document with a Go variable to produce a new document. Now, this is typically used to create HTML documents, text documents, and sometimes even code. The slide you're looking at right now was created from a template uh, by the Go Present tool. So you can see the useful applications of these templates. Um, you're probably wondering what this has to do with the command line and with command line tools. Well, it turns out that some applications, some notable applications like Docker, kubectl, and GoList allow the user to supply a template on the command line arguments. Um, now, you're probably wondering why they do this. Well, to understand uh, the motivation for this, consider that you might have to write a program yourself, a command line tool, and this command line tool is going to provide access to some sort of data. Now, this data could come from anywhere. It could come from your local hard drive. It could come from the result of a REST API query. It could come from a hive mind. It doesn't really matter. What's important is that you have to come up with a user interface for your application to allow the users to get at the data. So you'll probably think you might do this by adding a whole pile of commands and options to these commands that let the users issue their queries and format their data in all kinds of different ways. But the problem is, that if, uh, if your data source is non-trivial, and your data source probably is non-trivial if you're writing a tool to provide access to it, uh, you're not going to be able to anticipate all of the needs that your users are going to have. Uh, you might try by adding a whole pile of options, but eventually you'll have a really cluttered command line interface, and there will still be some people who are unhappy with it, and they will not star your project. So there are... Um, uh, there is another way, and this is used by uh, some really kind of high-profile Go utilities. And what these utilities do is rather than provide a whole plethora of options, they provide one option. It's called minus F. And to this minus F, you can pass a script. And to this script, these tools pass a Go variable. And you can then write a little script that can analyze this Go variable to produce various outputs. And this Go variable, I should have mentioned this, this Go variable represents some view of the data model that is exposed by the application. So this is a really powerful way uh, for tool writers to expose their data models to end users. And this is quite important because sometimes, you know, if you're writing a command line tool, uh, this tool is going to output some information to the screen uh, and in a pretty way that users can consume, but also the tool could be used by another tool. And so when this is the case, you really do want to have tight control over the output so it can be easily progressed, uh, processed programmatically. So this is all really fantastic. Uh, at least I thought it was fantastic, because about nine months ago, I started modifying some of our Go tools in Intel to accept command line templates. Uh, and I was delighted with myself. I called all my team members together, gave a presentation on the topic. I was expected to be promoted, uh, given the CTO job, but, uh, but this didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen was because uh, my team members were bewildered. And the reason they were bewildered was that it turned out to be really difficult to write Go templates to extract the sort of data we needed from our data model. Uh, so I went back to the drawing board, uh, but I was not defeated. And the reason I wasn't defeated is that this Go template language is extensible. And by extensible, I mean you can add new keywords. So I set about uh, adding a whole pile of new keywords to uh, implement the various use cases we had for our tool. And when I finished, I realized that all of these keywords I had added were totally generic. And so I did what any self-respecting Go programmer would do. I bundled them up into a package, and I shoved it on GitHub. And this package is called Template for Tools, uh, affectionately known as T4 Tools uh, by me, because I'm the only user right now. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, that's the package name as well. Um, yeah, so this is basically what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about uh, this package, T4 Tools, and how you use it uh, in your command line tools. 
but before I dive into T for Tools, I am going to do an overview of Go's uh, scripting language because I'm a little concerned if I start talking about T for Tools directly and present you with lots of examples. If you've never seen this language before, you will be totally bewildered, and I don't want to lose half of the audience uh, so soon into the talk. So we're going to start off with a simple example. Uh, I have uh, some Go code up here. You can see that I have two types, a person struct, uh, which has uh, some fields in it, like a family name and uh, two phone numbers, and it has an address, which is itself uh, a structure. And then I have a variable called db, which is just a slice of these persons. And I have a job to do. I need to convert this uh, in-memory in -memory database to a um, uh, HTML table. And so I have a little function here, it's called fprinttable, uh, and it's going to do the job for me. So if I run this, we should see I've got a nicely formatted HTML document, which is fantastic. What is not fantastic is the code that generated it. It's pretty hideous, as you can see. It's quite big, it's difficult to tell what the function is doing just by looking at it. There's loads, it's quite complicated, there's loads of if statements and for statements, uh, and there is a more pernicious problem, which I shall demonstrate by running the program live. Now, I hope this works. It does. Yes, okay. Um, so I have the program here. I am going to run it. It's called table uh, fumpt.go. And if I run it, you see the output. And what I'm going to do now is just redirect this output to a file. And I'm going to open that file in my browser. And you see. <laughs> and you see the table, which isn't very good. And you also see what is even worse. Uh, a message which says I've been hacked. And the reason I've been hacked is in my in-memory model, I had, uh, there was an HTML injection attack, which you can sort of see here. And uh, our fprint table function has just copied that injection attack directly into uh, the resulting HTML, which is pretty bad. So you're probably thinking there must be a better way to do this, and there is a better way to do this. In Go, you can do this using the template language. So here is another example of producing a similar HTML document, uh, but this time I'm using the template language. And so this, I hope you can see, is a lot simpler. There's a lot less code. It's kind of obvious what this function does. It's going to produce a document of some kind. You can also even determine the structure of the document just by looking at this, which is quite nice. Um, you can see in bold, this hasn't come out very well, but this bit here is in bold, and you can see part of this document has some funny directives in it, and these directives are delineated by the opening and closing double curly braces. And these are the template directives that I mentioned before. Um, and we'll talk about what all these mean in a minute, but basically what this is doing is it's just a sort of a simple loop that is uh, creating a new uh, HTML table row on each iteration. Now, down at the bottom of the function, this is quite interesting, we have two commands. The first command uh, creates a new template object, and it does this by parsing this document. Okay, so that's template parse. And then once we've created the template document, we can, uh, template object, we can execute it. And when we execute it, we give it two pieces of information. We give it a writer, which is where the output is going to go, and we give it a go variable. And db, if you remember from the first slide, is a slice of persons. So if I run this now, you see that I get a similar document, which is good, with less code. And if I actually run the program, excuse me, uh, it's this one, and I open that, you see that rather than uh, having a nasty uh, you've been hacked dialog popped up, the uh, uh, nasty attack has been escaped. And so this is much more secure. Okay. So let's take a little look at uh, some of the directives in the templating language. Uh, the first thing you need to understand about the templating language is this concept of a pipeline, and that is illustrated in this first example here. So a pipeline is just um, a template expression in, uh, surrounded by curly braces, and what it does is it evaluates the expression and it outputs to the writer associated with the template object. Now, in this case, uh, the expression is a string, and it evaluates to itself, and so that is what is output to the writer. Um, if you look at the bottom here, I have declared a new variable, p, which is a type of person again, and I'm going to pass this to the template script via the execute command. Once I've done that, I can access the elements of this Go variable 
um, using uh, the dot symbol. So the dot symbol represents something called a context. A context always refers to a Go variable. And when you first start executing your template, the context always refers to the variable you've passed in to template execute. So in this case, it's P. So P, uh, sorry, so dot first name here, this actually evaluates to P dot first name, which is Marcus. Um, you can change the meaning of the context with various direc uh, directives. One example of this is with. So with changes the meaning of the current context to its argument. So within this with block, uh, the meaning of the dot is actually p dot address. So dot country here actually evaluates to p dot address dot country, which evaluates to UK. Finally, one other thing you can do is sometimes you need to actually access the top level context object from inside a with block, and you can do that using dollar dot. So dollar dot evaluates to p dot first name, even though I'm in a with block, and hence it evaluates to Marcus. So if I run this, you should see what we expect. Uh, who is this guy and where does he live? Marcus. Marcus lives in the UK. Right. Uh, another directive that affects the uh, context is the uh, range directive. So range can be used to iterate through uh, a collection, so a slice, a map, or an array. Uh, and um, I have a little. And actually, on each iteration of the uh, of the range uh, loop, the dot operator is set to the current uh, element in the collection. So if I run this, I just should see the phone numbers printed out to the screen. Uh, I thought I would try and liven things up a bit at this stage by presenting you with some fun facts about templates. There are only two fun facts about templates to my certain knowledge. The first one is that there are actually two template packages. Uh, there's text template and HTML text HTML template. Uh, text template is for generating HTML documents, and text template uh, and text template is used for generating text uh, documents. Um, the HTML template uh, package generates HTML documents which are safe from HTML injection attacks, as we have seen. The two packages have identical APIs, and so you need to be a little bit careful when you're using them, particularly if you use something like Go Imports, because when you start typing the code template.parse, it will automatically stick an import in for you, and the import it sticks in is HTML template. At least that's what it does for me, so that may not be what you want, so you need to be a little bit careful about that. Fun fact number two, you can access structure fields from inside a template, as we have seen, but you can only do so if those fields are exported. So here you see a little example. We have a variable called test, which is an instance of a structure with one unexported field called name. And I have a little template here that's going to try and access this field, but if I run it, you will see that nothing is output because we cannot access the field because it is not exported. So if I export it quickly, we should see some goodness, and we do. Okay, uh, a little bit more about template directives. Uh, there is an if statement which allows you to conditionally output um, data to your document. I have a very simple example. Well, it's not actually a very simple example. I have an example here which converts a, uh, a slice of phone numbers uh, to JSON. And the if statement here is used to avoid outputting a leading comma in front of the first phone number to ensure my JSON is valid. So if I run that, you see I get my slice of phone numbers. We'll return to this example a little bit later on. Um, you can access the individual members of a collection using the index method. So if I'm accessing the members of an array or slice, I'm going to provide the array or slice, and then I'm going to provide a number. So in this case, this example, what it's going to do is it's just going to print out the elements of this slice in reverse order. And finally, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about functions. So you can invoke functions inside the templating language. And not only can you invoke functions, you can actually define new functions, uh, which you can define your own functions and add them to the template language, and then your scripts can call them. And uh, this is kind of a fundamental facility, and the t for tools package is built almost entirely on this, uh, on this capability. So let's have a look here. We have, um, we're going to add some new functions to the Go templating language, and we do it by calling the funks method on the template object. Now, the funks method takes a map as a parameter, and the map is going to take two pieces of information. It is going to map textual names to Go functions, and then these Go functions become available via these textual names inside your script. So if we have a little look at this example, we have a script here, and we are passing it the variable uh, P, and P just has one field defined, first name, which has a word uh, with white space uh, on both sides. So first name, when I execute this pipeline, I'm just going to get shamrock printed with the white space, trim, 
which is taken from the uh, standard library, is going to trim the white space on both sides and print out shamrock without any white space. And in the third example, trim is going to trim the white space and then it's going to pass the result of trimming the white space to the title function, which is going to put it in title case. So if I run this, you should see we've got white space, we've got no white space, we've got no white space, and title case. There is other ways you can chain functions together, and this is the notation I typically use, actually. Um, you can uh, use round brackets like this. I want to show you this because all my examples later on use this notation. So you get the same result. Fantastic. Okay, that's the overview of templates. If you already know about templates, you're probably incredibly bored. You may well be asleep. Now it's the time to wake up because we're going to talk about how we use these in command line tools. If you've never come across templates before, you're probably a little bewildered, but it doesn't really matter too much. You just need to accept that this templating language exists and it has support for some common programming language constructs like if and so forth, and you can use it to access and process Go variables. Okay, go list. So, the first command line tool that I know of that started using uh, templates, allowing users to pass templates, uh, is go list. Uh, go list is a tool in the uh, Go tool chain, and it allows you to find information out about the Go packages that are installed on your system. Uh, so, let's have a look at how this works. You run go list, and you path it, you give it a package specification. So I'm going to give it the T for tool specification. And what it does is it outputs uh, all of the packages that match uh, the T for tool specification. Is this big enough, actually? Can people see this at the back? Should I make this a bit bigger? OK, I hope that's good. Um, OK, so it just told us the package names that match the specification, which isn't very interesting. But if you provide a template script to GoList, you can extract all kinds of information about your packages. Now, to be able to write this template script, you need to know what the type of the variable GoList is going to pass to your script. And you can find this information out by looking at the help. So if I do GoList help, I see a whole pile of information. And right up at the top, I have a nice description of a structure called package. And here you have lots of lovely information. You can find out, for example, where, your, um, where the package is actually stored on the disk. You can find out what Go files constitute the package. You can even find out, and this is really, really interesting, uh, all of the other packages that your package imports. And you can also get a recursive list of all the dependencies, which is pretty useful. Uh, so let's take a look at how we extract some of this information. We've got to pro provide a script. Uh, first of all, let's have a look at all the Go files in my package. Uh, so I'm going to use range to print them out. Is that right? It is. So there you are. So I can get a list of all of the Go packages in my T for Tools package. Now let's do something different. Let's have a look at all of the other packages that T for Tools imports. And there you are. You get a list of all the packages that T for Tools imports. The nice thing about this actually is you can see that it doesn't import anything that isn't uh, outside of, that isn't in the standard library. So uh, T for Tools is nice and easy to vendor. Um, okay, uh, you can do other stuff like get a list of your recursive dependencies. Um, I think that's enough examples of GoList, but it gives you an idea. There's a whole plethora of information stored in these packages, and you can access these packages via GoList by providing a template script. Um, so this is all really good, but as I mentioned, there are quite a few problems with using the standard uh, template language uh, to enable command line scripting. Um, and the first problem is you have to document the types you're passing to your user scripts, otherwise your users won't be able to write those scripts. And so how do you provide that documentation? Well, GoList does it by hard coding the type information in a help string. So you can see here, this is a, a string, and then we've got a whole pile of uh, 
uh, type information inside this help. And this is problematic because it means that if you change the underlying type, you have to remember to change the documentation. And the compiler is not going to tell you that your documentation is out of date. Uh, and this was particularly problematic for us because we didn't have just one data structure. We had loads of different data structures for each of our different commands. And so trying to keep all the help up to date was a bit of a nightmare. And the other problem, and actually this is really the same problem given multiple examples of the same problem, but sometimes it's just really, really hard to write the scripts to extract the information you want. Uh, I have an example here uh, where we'd, all I want to do is print out the first three uh, dependencies for my package using go lists, and you can see there's quite a bit of code here. If you cast your mind back to the JSON example, that was hideous. I mean, there was maybe eight or nine lines of code. It was quite confusing. It wasn't really obvious what it was doing. Uh, convert, and that was only converting one slice to JSON. So that was pretty horrible. There's some basic things that you can't actually do, or at least I couldn't work out how to do. Uh, how do I kind of perform a query? So how do I do ask go list how many files in my package have the word debug in their name, and then count those, uh, count, count the uh, number of elements that match that query inside the template function? I couldn't work out how to do it. I couldn't work out how to access the last element of a generic collection with a template. Uh, and there's basic things you can't do as well. You could, there's no sorting in the language, and uh, it's difficult to output the information the way you want it. Uh, for example, if you want to output to a table, there's no easy way to do that. So this is where Template for Tools comes in. So Template for Tools was conceived to solve all of these problems. It is open source. It is on GitHub uh, under Intel T for Tools. And it provides, as you might imagine, solutions to all of the problems we have just discussed. So I'm not going to go through all these, but uh, we've already talked about it. Uh, well, actually, I am going to go through all of these. I'm going to go through all of these in great detail, uh, but just not on this slide. So let's start. Um, OK, the first thing it helps with is uh, generating help messages. And so this uh, facility is designed to make lives easier for the people who are writing the tools themselves. So as we've seen, you need to tell your user what your type looks like. And uh, um, if you don't want to automatically, if you don't want to include all of that information in your help documentation, you can use this function called generate usage undecorated. So if you look at this example here, I've got a new type, it's a stock, I've got a bunch of fields, and then I have a slice of these things called fictional stocks. Remember fictional stocks, because we're going to see that in a lot of the examples. If I pass this um, variable to generate usage undecorated, I'm going to get a nice uh, formatted type description. So there's no longer any need to embed this information directly in your help strings. You can just call this function, and it will generate a string for you, which you can output to the user. The nice thing about generate usage undecorated is it won't output information about fields that are not exported, and it doesn't do that because the user can't access them from inside the template script. It will, however, uh, output information about any exported methods that are defined on your types because these, interestingly enough, are uh, executable from inside a template script, as we shall see a little bit later on. There is a second version of this function called generated usage decorated, and this prints out the type information of the variable you pass to it, and it also prints out uh, information about all the new keywords that we've added to um, uh, the template library. So up the top, you can see uh, the type definition, and then if I scroll down, you see information about all these new functions, such as filter, filter contains, and so forth. We'll have a look at some of these in a minute. Um, this function needs a bit of work. When I first wrote it, I didn't have very many functions, but now I have quite a few functions. It generates far too much output, so I need to find a way to generate a more succinct uh, description of the functions that are available. OK, so the next facility that it provides is also a helper function for tool writers. It's called output to template. And what this does is, given a script and a writer and a Go variable, it's going to create a new template object for you. It's going to parse that script. It is going to add all of the new functions that uh, Template for Tools supports to this template object, and then it's going to execute the script and send the output to the writer. So it just saves you writing maybe, I don't know, six or seven lines of code. OK, so that's all the help that we provide to tool authors. Uh, the rest of the talk is about uh, the help we provide to people who are actually writing the scripts, the end user. Uh, and the first example, uh, and this is my favorite function, it's called table. Uh, table operates on a slice of structures or an array of structures, and it just pretty prints that uh, slice. So if I run it, you see a nice pretty printed um, 
uh, slice of structures. And it also automatically determines the column heading from the field names. So these things like ticker, name, last trade, these all come from the uh, field names of the type. Um, we have another formatting function called select, and select also works on slices of structures, and it views that slice of structures as a table, and it allows you to extract one column from that slice of structures. So if I run this, you see I selected, selected all of the uh, elements from the ticker column. There is a sort method, which is really nice. So sort operates on a slice or an array of structures, and it allows you to sort that slice or array by a given field. And actually what it does is it will create a new slice for you uh, containing all the elements but in the right order. And because it's returning you a new slice of structures, you can then pass it directly to table, uh, which is quite cool. So most of the functions I'm going to talk about here that we've added are composable, so you can chain them all together. Wow, I am running slow. Uh, so, as you can see, everything is sorted. Uh, let me try and uh, sort by descending order. You can do that. And you can also sort by uh, different types. So there I was sorting by strings. Uh, if I sort by volume, that's an int. You can see that you can also sort by volumes. Right, let's take a look at extracting data. So there's a whole pile of functions uh, that allow you to extract data. And what these functions do is that given a slice of structures, they uh, perform a filter on a given field of that slice of structures and return you a new array or a slice uh, with the elements that match the cert criteria. So in this case here, I'm just gonna filter on the company uh, on the name field, uh, and I'm gonna filter for any companies that have the name company uh, or the word company in their names. So as you can see, we're able to filter. There's a whole pile of these functions you can filter on a suffix, a prefix, on a regular expression, or you can do a case insensitive comparison. There are two functions called head and tail, which allow you to extract the first and last elements of a slice or an array, as you might imagine. So if I run this, you see I'm getting the first uh, elements, uh, you can do tail as well. Uh, these functions actually return a slice, and the reason they return a slice is that you can also specify, uh, give me the last three elements, for example. So I do that, and I get my last three elements. Uh, there are two more extraction functions, rows and calls. Rows operates on a slice of functions and allows you base a slice of, any slice actually it works on, and it just allows you to request the particular rows that you're interested in. So in this example here, I'm gonna print out a table with the second, fourth, and sixth rows. And calls uh, is similar in some ways, but it's also different in that it only works on a slice or a uh, array of structures, and you have to specify the column names that you're interested in. So I can do ticker volume. There we go. Um, okay, let's get to the last few functions. Uh, these are related to formatting. Uh, there is a method called toJSON, which allows you to convert your variable to JSON. So if I run that, it prints everything out nicely to the screen. Um, but you don't have to print out the entire variable. You can uh, select the part of the variable you actually want. So if I just wanted to print out the first element, I would do something like this and you just get the first element in JSON. If I just was interested in the name, I could do this. So you can you know, st uh, select exactly the part of the data structure input interested in and uh, output that to JSON. Describe, uh, I'll skip describe, I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Uh, promote is a function that allows you to uh, take a structure field, which is embedded in a forest of data structures, and promote that to a top level slice. And this is kind of interesting if you need to extract information uh, out of, uh, that's deeply embedded in data structures. Um, to, uh, to visualize. So in this example here, I'm promoting the name field from the fictional DB database, fictional stocks database, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna return me a slice of strings containing all the names. Okay, right. So that was probably all a little bit abstract and contrived, um, but the good news is I have a non-contrived example, and this is a piece of code that was written uh, by one of my colleagues, Manohar Castellino, uh, and he sent me an email a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, I found this use for your tool, for your package, um, and I took a look at it, and then I marveled at its beauty for 20 minutes, and then I shoved it in 
directly to slide 16 because it was so beautiful. I wanted to share it with you. And the reason it's beautiful is because it illustrates just how powerful these templates and this uh, T4Tools package is. So this is the code in its entirety. It is uh, an ELF dump tool. So ELF is the binary format we use on Linux for executables and libraries and object files. And what this tool allows you to do is it allows you to explore the metadata that is included in these, uh, in these executable files. And it does it in about 15 lines of code. So it opens a file, it takes that file, and it passes it to a package in the Go standard library uh, called ELF, and ELF parses this uh, file, and then it returns me a Go variable. And now I've got a Go variable, I can pass it directly to template for tools, and we can, invent, we can explore uh, the ELF headers. So actually, on macOS, obviously, you've got uh, macho, not ELF, so I've downloaded a Linux binary here. The binary I'm going to be showing you is curl. I hope I didn't do this. Let me see. Okay, so what you've got to do is you've got to give this two... Uh, parameters. The first is a script and the second is a file name. So if I run this, I've used the describe command and describe is like uh, uh, generate usage undecorated, but you can actually run it from inside the template. So what describe does is it's telling me all the information about the variable that has been passed to my script. And you can see here we've got a whole pile of information about uh, the ELF file itself. And you've also got a whole pile of methods. Uh, that provide information, and we can go ahead and call some of those methods now. So let me let's have a look at all of the imported libraries of. Problem with this is, have I spelled that correctly? <laughs> is that right? No, I have not spelled it correctly. Okay, so you can see that my curl binary is importing four different libraries. Um, now let's have a look at the symbols, and the symbols are kind of cool, because if you look at the imported symbols method, which I shall show you, uh, is it that one? You see that it returns a slice of structures, and because it returns a slice of structures, we can pass it directly to table, and we will get out a nice table. You see? Yeah, pretty cool. But we can do better than that. We can actually uh, filter the table for the information that we're interested in. Now, I'm only interested in seeing the symbols that come that are imported from uh, the standard library. So if I specify the library field, and then what is it? lib.c.s. So have I spelled this right? No. About six. <laughs> oh, live coding. Uh, File, thank you. Thank you. And it's still not working. A filer. <laughs> oh dear. Aha, okay, fantastic, it worked. So there you go. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so you can also uh, take a look at um, some of the, uh, if I go back to describe, uh, we can take a look at some of the information in the headers. So, for example, there's a program header here which contains some interesting information. So let's just get at that. Uh, and I'm going to do table progs. And because uh, the information I actually want is embedded within a structure, I'm going to use promote prog header. Is that right? and you can see a list of all the program headers. If I hadn't used promote, what would have happened is that I would have been given a table um, which contains a structure and a reader, which isn't very interesting. And so what promote does, it allows me to focus in on the information I want and then promote that up. So that is uh, elf dump. There's also uh, a version, which I don't think I have time to show you, called macho dump, which uh, is pretty much the same, only it works on OS X, and it works just by changing two lines of code. Okay, uh, just, I think I need to finish up. Uh, do I have time to go through this slide? I've got time. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, that's, that's fine. Okay, so I'll slow down a bit and catch my breath. <laughs> uh, yeah. I got to. <laughs> okay.
Okay, okay, that's perfect, that's perfect. So let's slow down and uh, consider the, the last slide. Actually, would anybody like to see Macho Dump before I... Yeah. Should we do Macho Dump? Okay, so what I'm gonna... Oh, it's more live coding. I'm gonna change this to Macho Dump. So I'm just gonna change two little pieces of code. I hope this is gonna work. So if I run this now, if I run it, it should probably give me an error, and it does because it says invalid magic number because I'm running it on the Linux binary. But if I run it on the Mac OS version of uh, curl, it doesn't work. Uh, oh, that's because that field probably doesn't exist. Let me do a describe. Okay, and here we are. So now we've just made a small modification to our program and now we have a macho uh, uh, dump program where we can explore uh, information about macho files. And as you can see here, you have a slightly different data structure, right? Uh, but you have lots of similar information uh, such as imported symbols. So why not? Let's have a look at it. I'm not gonna print it out in a loop, but if I just print it out like that, you get all of the important symbols. So I hope this kind of illustrates how useful this can be. With just a few lines of code, you can take a Go variable uh, and you can explore the data structure programmatically um, from, uh, without modifying any of the original code. Okay, elf dump and matching dump. So uh, I'm gonna finish up with some guidelines and uh, these are guidelines for people writing command line tools. Uh, guideline number one is you should allow users to tailor the output of your tools. I mentioned this on the first slide, and uh, the point was that you know you can't possibly anticipate all the different things users are going to want to do with your tools, all the different ways they're going to want to query your data, all the different ways you're, they're going to want to format it. And so because of this, you should allow uh, them some flexibility with how they consume your data. And my recommendation, of course, is to do this using a template. Uh, provide a minus F uh, option. If you do this, uh, you must make sure that you document the types that you're going to pass to Go program. Some tools allow you to pass a template, but don't actually tell you uh, much about the types they're going to pass to your scripts. And so it makes, you, it makes it really difficult for you to write those scripts because you don't know the structure of the data. So always document the types past your template scripts, uh, as we have seen with GoList. Um, you need to consider that once you start passing Go types and Go variables to template scripts, these template scripts are now part of a public API because people are going to be coding against them. So you need to be very careful to make sure you do not uh, break backward compatibility when you introduce changes to these structures. Um, otherwise, you're going to break uh, a lot of users' scripts, which won't be very good. Um, another issue to consider is uh, something uh, that Go List does that I don't really like very much. When you execute Go List, um, you can actually specify a wildcard, and that wildcard can match multiple um, packages, right? And we already saw that. We saw multiple packages being printed to the screen. But if you specify a template and your wildcard matches multiple packages, your template is invoked once for each of those packages. And that makes it hard to perform a computation across the entire set of packages. So for example, if you wanted to find out, uh, get write one template script that computed and sorted the list of all dependencies of a group of packages, you couldn't really do that with GoList. Um, so my advice would be, uh, only execute the template script once, and if you've got uh, a collection of items you want to pass to that template script, pass the collection uh, as a slice rather than invoking the script multiple times on each element of that collection. And finally, uh, yeah, don't use interface in your public types because it also makes it really difficult for users to uh, uh, use uh, those kind of variables. And when I say avoid interface in your public types, avoid interface, empty interface in uh, the variables that you're passing to your Go scripts. I just have a little example here. Uh, I have uh, a slice of fictional stocks, but rather than uh, uh, using the stock type here, it's, uh, I use the empty interface type here. So I'm losing type information. So when I run this, you can see I don't get any useful type information. But if this is stock, I do get useful type information. Now, even though uh, we're passing the template an interface object, the template, if it knows 
what that type is, you can still access it. So I can still do index zero, I think. I can try that. Uh, and that will, that will work, right? Um, but I, you know, I had to know this. Um, I can't easily get this information, and there's no guarantee. Um, if I treated this as a stock, there's no guarantee that each element of that collection would be a stock. And so this code might work for element one, but it might not work for element two. So don't do that either. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, go ahead and use templates in your tools. Uh, yeah, so we have time for questions. Yes. Yeah. That's okay, no problems. So that was good. Uh, the the very first one that you showed that listed all of the types that had where they had the hard coded string where they'd put comments in. Yeah. Can you do something similar? The very first. So um, you you said in the go list. You mean? Yeah, yeah. So they have that literal that says this is the structure, and you fix that through your describe method. But it also listed here's the thing name whatever. And it had some a has comment it about got it, the so. comments. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No. That does not work. And that's an excellent question. It is possible if the Go source is present uh, on the system. Then I think with the comments, I think that you could do it. But if you had just a, if you just had the binary file, I'm not sure you could do it. I was thinking of maybe coming up with some sort of. Uh, system based on tags to allow you to provide this information. But uh, that is definitely a shortcoming and it is not addressed yet. But I think there will be uh, a workaround. And like you say, it will use tags, yeah. I should enter an issue. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so some command line tools let you output, uh, I guess, the, the response in, say, JSON or YAML format. Right. And with JSON, you can use like the JQ tool to uh, pipe the data into that and then do your filtering separately. What do you think are some of the advantages of doing it in the command line tool itself versus leaving it to an external tool to do the filtering? Uh, it looked like... Uh, some of the interesting ones there were like you can use methods in Go templating, whereas right. with like JSON you just have the raw data. But I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Uh, not, uh, not particularly. I suppose the thing I like about doing everything in the template is that uh, it reduces the number of tools you need, and so everything is fairly self-contained, um, reduces your dependencies. But uh, yeah, you could uh, uh, use an external uh, processing tool. Um, I wonder if you looked at other tools that make extensive use of templates. Uh, Hugo comes to mind as having a very rich set of functions that they inject, some of which are very similar to yours, and I, I wonder whether you did any sort of research to sort of look for common patterns that could be pulled out. Yeah, I, I did take a little look at Hugo, um, uh, and it does essentially do the same sort of thing. Of course, it has a different uh, uh, purpose. It's to generate HTML pages. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess I need to take a closer look and see if there are any uh, sort of synergies between the two and see if there's any uh, functions that we can exchange. But you know, when I looked at this, I sort of felt that um, this, this package was viable because it had a sort of a different um, a different purpose in mind. It is specifically for uh, enabling templates and command line tools. And so I felt that the purpose was you know, su sufficiently distinct from Hugo to uh, make it viable and useful. Right, any more questions? Okay, well thank you very much.